Good afternoon, my name is Chris Kramer. I'm from the government, I'm here to help. No? Okay, I should have brought candy or something. Um, my background is uh, written in the book there. Basically, I'm an old uh, trench public information officer uh, working with crisis and risk communication, spent a lot of time doing that, and uh, was uh, very happy when they asked me to come in and talk a little bit about public understanding of radiation, nuclear issues, how the media handles things, how the public views this stuff, and how to communicate effectively during a time of crisis. I will promise you one thing. You can read my slides, just so you know. Okay, all right. First of all, that's not mine. There we go. What are we going to talk about there? We're going to talk about radioactive stuff. What do people know about radioactive stuff? We're going to talk a little bit about communicating, how to communicate effectively day to day and during a time of crisis. Scary words, frightening things. The public is terrified of anything radiological or nuclear and what to do when it hits the fan. Okay, now what do we know about radiation? What do we know about nuclear material here in the U.S. and many other places, too? We don't know a lot, actually. For many of us, especially those in my age bracket, uh, this was our first introduction to anything having to do with radiation or nuclear power. It was a uh, 1956 movie and book synergy, one of the very first, that uh, Walt Disney Studios put together called Our Friend the Atom. And the analogy was that atomic energy was like a genie being released from the bottle. We had split the atom, releasing the genie, and it would do all kinds of magical things for us. It would heat our homes, it would power our cars, it would uh, power robots that walk our dogs. I don't know, they did everything, okay? And again, most of us actually do get any type of information about radiation, about radiological material, and about nuclear from pop culture. That's where we get this, and that's where most of people in the United States especially get their information. You have to go back to the mid-1950s, 1954, the release of Godzilla. Yeah, Godzilla put a face to nuclear fears at that point. It, same year in the United States, that fabulous movie about giant ants in the desert, them came out, creating, of course, these giant monsters because of exposure to radiation at that time. And you might not know this, the very popular zombie genre that's out there right now, everybody loves zombies, all started with a 1968 film, Night of the Living Dead, what do you think created the zombies? Radiation, exactly. So, in our public consciousness, we have this knowledge of what things are that involve nuclear, radiological, all based on pop culture. Last year, a couple of very big popular films involved people that were exposed to radiation. Captain America, created by radiation. Spider-Man, bitten by a radioactive spider. And of course, my personal favorite is this guy. Whenever he becomes angry or outraged, a startling metamorphosis occurs. He was exposed to radiation. This is what people hear about. This is the information they take in. Of course, it's completely false, but that's what they're exposed to on a regular basis. However, anything to do with radiation, anything to do with nuclear, is terrifying to most people, beyond the realm of comic books, that is. Whenever you use the words radioactive, radiation, nuclear, it hits a core fear in American and in Western society that is just makes people tremble. They immediately think of cancer. They immediately think of disease. They immediately think of um, nuclear waste. These are the images that they have. They have a lot of misinformation about it too. So, all of these images that the public has about the stuff we will be transporting on the roads many times is misinformation because of pop culture, okay? It's actually part of a much larger problem, and that problem is we don't know jack about science in this country. We really don't. We score very poorly in that kind of stuff. I'll give you some examples here. National Science Foundation does a survey every year of public understanding of science. Here's what the public does not know. 38% does not know that a father's gene decides the sex of a baby. Over half of people in America cannot explain why you see lightning before you hear thunder. Half don't know lasers work by focusing light instead of sound. 47% do not know electrons are smaller than atoms. Here are my two favorites here. 28% of people in America do not know that the Earth revolves around the sun. 
It's been 500 years since Copernicus. You'd think we would have had this one by now, okay? And about half of people in America don't know that it takes the Earth one year to revolve around the sun. These two groups right here, I, I will posit, are probably pretty much sum up why Adam Sandler films are so popular. 33% of Americans think astrology is a science. Eeny meeny, chilly beeny. And 19% of Americans with graduate degrees also think that. So there is a lot of misinformation. How do we rate internationally, by the way? Studies, we look at high school kids. What's their base understanding of science? We rate, actually, I just looked, they just released the stats today for last year. We've slipped. We've gone from 21st to 24th in basic high school knowledge of science, okay? The Dutch are beating us, okay? We suck. We don't do very well at all when it comes to science, okay? So if we don't have a basic understanding of just science, how can we expect people to understand anything about radiation? How can we understand them, think they're gonna understand this stuff? Well, here's the thing. Those of us that work in the world of science and technology, we call it the deficit model. Well, if we just explain it to people, they'll understand. Doesn't work like that. Logic, reason, has no place in human communication when you get right down to it. We are emotional creatures. We view the world through many lenses. Our culture, our religion, our politics, biology, there are lots of lenses we apply when we view the world. And many of those lenses come from pop culture and other areas, and they will shade how people perceive anything nuclear or radiological. They will shade those things. So we can't just go out there and give them the facts. Doesn't matter. It's interesting, they've actually done some studies and they found that people with college degrees are far more biased than those without. When they were doing studies of uh, uh, climate science and whether or not people accept that you know, there's global warming and stuff like that, they found that people with college degrees will deny the facts far greater sometimes. We have lenses, we have these views that are embedded into us over time and we're not gonna change them very easily. And when we think we're being, you know, well, I'm gonna take a look at this and, and, and see if the, what the facts say and then I'll decide, we're actually cherry picking facts to support our pre-held views. And so dealing with anything with radiation and nuclear issues, people have a lot of fears, people have a lot of mistrust, they don't understand it, can't blame them for it. They haven't worked in that world, okay? And just telling them about it may not be enough, okay? Communication challenges, here's what we found. Nuclear and radiation risks are perceived as the riskiest and the most dreaded. Again, people have a high level of fear and misunderstanding and anything radiological or nuclear. High degree of public apprehension and misinformation about it too. And we found there's been virtually no communication since the Cold War days on what people should do in case there is a radiological or nuclear incident where they have to take action to protect themselves. We really haven't done a very good job of communicating what they need to know and what they need to do. It is interesting, growing up during the Cold War, when we would get under our plywood desks to protect us from the nuclear blast. Um, <laughs> exactly. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, it just kind of went away. But here's the thing, and I was explaining this to my daughter the other day. I said, you can't blame our generation for being screwed up because we used to have NORAD tracking Santa Claus. You remember that one? Is that a Russian intercontinental ballistic missile with multiple impact reentry vehicles? No, it's just good old St. Nick. Is it any wonder we're not screwed up? Okay, but we're not communicating very well, okay? And I actually had this said to me. I was uh, doing some training for someone here at the lab in our nuclear division. She's high up in the chain, so I'm not gonna name names here. But as I'm explaining how people don't understand this stuff, she looks at me and goes, you mean I gotta dumb this down for Ma and Pa Kettle? I don't know if you remember the Ma and Pa Kettle films, <coughs> but first of all, I thought it was kind of an interesting analogy she threw out because Ma and Pa Kettle always won against the smart city slickers. Uh, but I said, yes, you do. And I mentally made a note that I would never put her on camera. Um, but here's, here's the point I wanna make. People aren't stupid. 
those numbers I was giving you earlier is not to say people are stupid. They just don't have that knowledge. I'll give you an example. My brother-in-law lives in Wisconsin on a farm. He builds houses for a living, okay? When I say he builds houses, he pours the concrete, he puts the shingles on the roof, and can do everything else in between. The electrical, the HVAC, the drywall, you name it. He has a skill set. He has knowledge. How many people in this room can build a house from scratch? So it's specialized knowledge. We have specialized knowledge. He has specialized knowledge. So just because they don't know these things doesn't mean they're stupid necessarily, okay? So just bear that in mind. We do have to explain it to them, especially during a time of crisis, because they need that information. We'll talk more about that in a second. I did want to talk briefly about science and the news media. If you were to have an incident transporting anything nuclear or radiological, you can bet there will be lots of reporters involved in this incident, right? So, what do they know about it? First of all, those of us in the science and technology world don't have a very high opinion of the news media. 76% say a major problem for those working in science and technology is the news doesn't distinguish between solid and sloppy findings. Also, over, about half say the news media's oversimplification is a major problem, okay? But most people still get any information about science, technology, the initial information about anything that might be happening from the news. Then they'll go online and search it out. But they've been cutting back in the newsroom. 2008, CNN got rid of their science, space, and tech unit. Boston Globe shut down theirs in 2009. A recent survey found in five hours of cable news, you'll get one minute of science and technology news. That's about it. We're much more fascinated with what the Kardashians are doing. So there is a cultural clash that goes on between those that work in science and technology and those that work in the news business, OK? Very different worlds they work in. I spent a long time as a reporter, so I understand this, OK? Science and technology, slow and methodical. We're into detail and accuracy. It's two-way communication. We are specialists. We include others in our discussions. We want input on our papers and whatnot. And we focus on being detached and factual. In the newsroom, need for speed, got to have it now, got to have it now, don't second check, don't wait for facts, got to have it now. Accurate but big picture is what they're going for. It's very much a one-way dialogue. Reporters are generalists. There are no more beat reporters anymore that specialize for the most part. It's very narrow focused and is driven by emotion. Two completely different worlds. So it's going to be very difficult for them to work together many times to get information that is accurate out to the public. Now, let's say you need to communicate. <coughs> Excuse me. If we do need to get information out to people, let's talk a little bit about keys to communicating radiation risk and reality, OK? I want to start with a couple definitions, because people tend to mix these things up, risk and crisis communication. They are not the same. Risk is this. Something bad may happen. Pretty much it, right? We live in a world of risk. We're surrounded by risk. We have risk all around us from the time we get up to the time we go to bed. And sometimes in bed, we have risk. Again, I've reached the age where I wake up in the morning and something hurts and I have no idea how I hurt it. Sleeping. Well, how does that happen? We have this risk, OK? Risks are constant. Interestingly, people are willing to accept a risk if they feel they have control over it. My lovely wife, for example. She won't get in the ocean. We'll go on a vacation near a beach somewhere. She won't get in the ocean. Won't do it. Not at all. Will not get in the ocean. Anybody care to guess why? Sharks. Exactly. Sharks. My wife has the same phobia. Won't do it. Won't do it. Everywhere. I'll say, sweetheart, I'll pull up stats like six people a year die in shark attacks. I said, you got less than one in a billion chance of dying in a shark attack. Do you know why she's afraid of sharks? Jaws, exactly. Jaws. Steven Spielberg ruined an entire generation for going to the beach. Doesn't matter. And here's the funny thing. Every time there is a shark attack somewhere, she'll print it up and write in a big red Sharpie, I told you so, and leave it on my desk. You got one now, here's what happens, though. 
This is the same woman who'll drive down the street in a real little red sports car doing her nails, talking on the cell phone, and not wearing her seatbelt. Doesn't matter. She feels she has control over that. So, risks are constant. They're always there. If we feel we have control over it, we don't fear it as much, okay? So, in preparing for risk, if you need to prepare people for a potential risk, if there's something going on, transporting through an area, you want people to be prepared in case of a risk or whatnot, here's what we found. Average people showing what they're doing to prepare for risk. You can't scare them, you can't give them facts and figures, doesn't work. You want to show people, like the people you're communicating with, doing the activity to prepare for the risk. That's what you want to do. Behavior, science, disaster impacts, blah, 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 doesn't matter. Showing people, like themselves, doing the activity of preparing for the risk will motivate them. And you have to do it over and over and over again, by the way, too. Now, crisis is a little different. Something bad has happened. The cool thing with a crisis is it will go away, unlike risks. It will go away. A subcategory of a crisis is an emergency. That's a crisis involving life and safety issues, okay? So, during a time of crisis, we found that people just want to know three things. They want to know three things. That's really it. What happened? What does it mean to me? What are you doing to solve the problem? So, if you or one of your counterparts does have to get up in front of the camera, something bad has happened, something's loose in the environment, you got to talk about it. This is what you want to know. What happened? What does it mean to me? What are you doing about it? That's what people want to know. You can add other information in there, but you got to give them this or they're not going to listen to you. This is what they want to know. During alerts and warnings, by the way, public does not panic. There's this misconception. There's going to be panic. Ah! People don't run with their arms flailing about. Most don't. The vast majority. People are information hungry, especially during an emergency. The messages are most effective when repeated often. They want it from multiple sources, too. And they will confirm. We call this digital milling today. They're going to check Facebook and Twitter and websites before they do it. Milling, you're familiar with the concept of milling. There's, a, there's an alert that goes out, and before we do anything, we're going to check with everybody else. We see it, I see it here at the lab during our fire drills. Everybody walks in the hallway and stands and looks at each other. What do you think? Should we go? It's lunchtime, okay. Milling, that's what people do. It's a human behavior. We want to see what other people are doing during a crisis before we take action, okay? Oh, and the instructions need to make sense, unlike Three Mile Island. Tell them simple, easy to understand actions they can take. Whether it's stay home, shelter in place, evacuate, go to this shelter, here's where you go, yada yada. But give them something to do. It's maybe so, something as simple as just stay tuned for more information. Timing's everything. How you handle those first minutes of a crisis will determine how people react to it and how your agency is portrayed in the future. Don't sit on it. It'll just get worse, okay? And the language that we use can be incredibly frightening. We work in a scary business. We have scary words that we deal with to the public. They're normal to us, but they're scary as heck to the rest of people. Radiation, nuclear, horrible stuff, right? And fear is normal. The human brain is actually hardwired to default to fear. If we don't understand something, we are afraid. If we encounter something we don't know or have never seen before, we become afraid. So for most people dealing with radiological or nuclear issues, they're going to be afraid. Fear is contagious. Do you know that if I walk into this room and everybody's looking apprehensive, Body language is all kind of clenched in, faces look scared. I'm going to automatically become afraid, even if I don't know what's going on, even if I don't know what it is. And we pay attention to what other people are afraid of. If everybody is focused on an issue in our community, we'll start focusing in on it too, even if it doesn't affect us many times. Credible experts will diminish fear. 
people that have credibility that come out to talk about it, recognized public leaders, scientists with a lot of letters behind their names, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If they're a credible expert, we will be more likely to believe what they say during a crisis. Is it natural or human created? We have a lot of natural hazards and disasters in the world. You said a tornado just south of here. Horrible situation. People are much more willing to accept natural disasters, natural crisis. But a technological or human created crisis will create a sense of outrage in people. They're going to be mad. And they're going to be looking for somebody to blame. Will it be your company? Your organization? Somebody's going to wear the black hat if something gets out. Be prepared for that. Uncertainty again, if we don't know, fear. And of course, I mentioned words can be scary and they are filled with power too. Words are very powerful. The words we choose to use, the words the public uses during a crisis, have a lot of power behind them. We call it loaded language. Loaded language. They're designed to appeal to emotion. You saw a lot of it during the last election, okay? Let me give you an example. Loaded language, power of words, connotation behind them. How many people in this room work for a government? How many people work for a regime? It's the same thing. It's just another name for government, and I love watching the news. We'll talk about the US government, blah, 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 and the Syrian regime. Same thing. How many people are government ser public servants? How many people are bureaucrats? <laughs> My favorite, one of my favorite loaded language terms was during the last election, job creators. Instead of rich people, job creators. Okay, another group. Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, so there are tons of these, and they are designed to appeal to emotion. Here's one of my all time favorite loaded language examples here. When Kraft was introducing their new cheese product, the cheese makers wanted it labeled embalmed cheese. How many of you would have a grilled embalmed cheese sandwich for lunch today? I think there's a lot of the same chemicals in both processes, maybe. Government said, no, it's disparaging, so go ahead and call it process cheese instead, okay? So, words have power, just remember that, okay? Whatever you're talking about. And when you are communicating science and technology, especially during a crisis, Everyday simple comparisons, make details clear, keep it simple. Remember, eighth grade level. They're not stupid, they just don't have this knowledge, okay? And avoid jargon. The number one bane of our existence is jargon and acronyms and things like that. Sorry, I'm gonna have a little bit of water here, I'm drying out. <clears throat> I love this phrase. Some guys during the Deepwater Horizon incident were trying to explain plume formation. Does anybody understand this? This is what they were going to put out at one point. Dude, you're speaking Romulan. I have no idea what that says, okay? So watch the jargon, watch the terminology, those specialized words we use, because people don't understand it, okay? So during a crisis, keep it simple. People are under stress, they're scared. When they're scared, their cognitive capabilities are diminished. They can't understand as well. Simple, direct messages and actions to take graphics help. I don't have a whiteboard. I do have a whiteboard. Fukushima incident. Folks on the west coast of the United States were all up in arms saying, oh my gosh, radiation is coming across the Pacific. Sidebar here. There was a huge spike in the number of searches on Wikipedia for Godzilla during Fukushima. I, I'm not kidding. So, and again, so the experts are getting out talking about, well, we'll have an egg increase in the number of Pico Curies and blah, 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 whatever that means. I have no idea what a Pico Curie is. I'm sorry, I don't. I thought that was a character in a Japanese cartoon. Um, but the LA, the LA Times did a great graphic. They did this. They had this big red circle. They said, this is the amount of radiation we are exposed to every day in our lives. Background radiation, our cell phones, blah, 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 all this stuff. The sun. Here's the amount of extra radiation we'll be getting from Fukushima. That was it. Simple graphic in the newspaper. Suddenly people went, oh, I get that. That's not so bad. So graphics, simple everyday comparisons can be a great help in those areas, okay? 
Avoid jargon again. Clear, concise, technical details clear, simple comparisons never lie. Tell people what to expect if you have a crisis. Nothing's worse than not knowing, because we will come up with something far worse than the reality of no matter how bad it is, okay? Tell them what's likely to happen. This is what we expect will happen. Should we tell them the worst case scenario? Should we? Yeah, why not? Tell them the truth. Again, they're not going to panic, and no matter what we tell them, it'll be better than what they can come up with on their own, trust me. Give them something to do, by the way, some action to take. It'll help mitigate their fear. V visuals are great. They help make the story interesting, et cetera, et cetera. Anybody ever watch Dr. Oz, by the way? You ever see that show, Dr. Oz show? My wife loves this stuff. She swears she'll do everything he says. I've been nagging at her for years. You should take a multivitamin, dear. Eh. Dr. Oz says take a vitamin, she buys out GNC. I don't know what it is about this guy. But he does great examples. He had some cheesy example of like a constricted artery and he had like ping pong balls through a big clear tube, blah, blah, blah. Again, cheesy, but people can understand this stuff. So you do have to explain something about the transport or potential risk or whatever. If you've got a demonstration of some kind, that's great. All right? Why do we do this? Why do we even want to communicate, especially during a crisis, okay? Well, we get important information to people who might need it. Could be life-saving information. We create and enhance our authority and credibility by talking. If we're talking and we're the first ones out there, we have the authority and credibility. We've framed the argument at this point, okay? We calm public fear and anger, we control the information, and provide damage control if possible, okay? I did want to mention this. Some basic communication stuff. Between 70 and 90% of all communication is nonverbal. If you do have an incident and you find yourself having to go on camera or some of your folks from your organization or agency, <coughs> just remember a lot of it's nonverbal. How they dress, what they look, et cetera, et cetera, does mean a lot. And I just wanted to mention a couple things real quick about body language during a time of crisis. People say, well, you know, I, I don't want to talk on camera. Well, you might have to. You may be the expert that's called on. So some things to think about. There's a camera right there. I'm going to use it as an example here. First of all, where do your eyes go? Never look at the camera. Talk to the reporter. Just look at the reporter and talk to the reporter, okay? Now at a public meeting, if you're doing some kind of a public forum, that's different. You engage with the audience. You talk to them. You make eye contact, okay? Posture goes back to kindergarten. Stand up straight. Stand up straight. Don't wiggle. Don't wobble. You don't want to do it standing by a lectern. Don't want to do it when you're on camera, okay? I'm kind of nervous like this. I, I, I kind of wiggle and wobble. People are dancers when they get nervous, et cetera, et cetera. So I've learned over time that if I stand like this with one foot back, angled to the side, another one's right in front of me, angled out like this, it's a very stable platform. If you did have to go on camera during a crisis, this will keep you stable in one position. It's also slimming, so it looks good. <laughs> Your hands, I get a lot of people say, what do I do with my hands? What do I do with my hands? This is what looks best on camera. Your arms hanging loosely at your sides. It's ungodly uncomfortable though. It's horrible. Try it though. Go to a, go to a party next time. Next time you're at a party, just stand and talk like this for a while. It'll weird people out too. It's kind of fun. But I'm a hand talker. So if you talk with your hands, that's okay. As a matter of fact, it actually can help you out. We found through research that if you talk to people with your hands in front of you and your palms up like this, this automatically, instinctively engenders trust in the people you're talking to across all cultures. If I talk like this, hands in front of me, palms up, not like this, not flat like this, this means I want something. <laughs> Maybe when you go to the boss, you can do this one. Kind of angled like this. This instinctively engenders trust in whoever you're talking. So you are a little bit more believable. With your hands in front of you, your palms up like this. Never point. That's very parental. Don't want to be parental. Don't do that. It's okay to have notes in your hand, by the way, too. And uh, I think I got everything else. Size, all that stuff. We got that covered. Okay, didn't want to spend a lot of time on that, too. Obviously, many of us work in classified, secure environments. There are things we cannot talk about. How can that truck protect itself if nobody's there? Can't tell you. But you can always talk about something, all right? Again, we want to be as open as we can. That gives us credibility and confidence in the public's view so when we want them to do something. So when questions come up we can't talk about it, here's what you want to do. Tell them why you can't talk about it 
You can go back to process and then get back to what you can talk about. There's something I call the four P's. Siebenen works in the classified environment. Four P's you can always talk about. Plans, process, policy, procedure. You can always talk about those things. Five, communication failures. These are the big failures during any type of disaster or crisis. Mixed messages from multiple sources. Multiple groups saying different things. Confuses people, everybody loses credibility. Information released late. Sitting on information is terrible, especially when life and safety is at risk. Never do that. Get it out there. It might not be clean, and you can say this is what we know at this time, which is fine, because it may change. Crises always evolve and change rapidly in the field. So tell them what you know at that time. Those paternalistic attitudes, telling people what to do, you do this because I'm the expert stuff, uh-uh. Especially not in today's world. It's all about engagement and dialogue. People want to have a conversation with you. They want real information. Not countering rumors and myths in real time. And of course, public power struggles and confusion. People duking it out for political means in the public arena during a crisis is never a good idea. Nobody wins on that one. Any questions? I know it covered a lot of stuff. We could literally spend days talking about communication during a crisis, issues on radiological understanding, things like that. But I was just happy to have about a half an hour to cover your time. Any questions at all? Yes? What do you do in a situation where somebody asks you a question and you don't know the answer? The reason I'm asking that is I was involved in a series of, of, of public forums. Mm -hmm. Certain individuals would come in, and if they didn't know the answer to the question, they'd make something up. That's really bad. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the simplest answer. I don't know, but I can try and find the answer for you. Did I answer your question? Any other questions? Yes? Where'd you get my class picture? That does kind of look like you, doesn't it? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, part and you're absolutely right. And there, um, there are efforts now to communicate and educate uh, the news media on the world of science and technology, what the realities are. Uh, you've heard of the Alan Alda School of, of Science Communication with the Media, et cetera, et cetera. There are some continuing efforts. And what we found is this is going to be a process. It's not going to happen overnight. And again, the two worlds are very, very different. And a lot, the media is changing right now. When I first got into the news business in the 1980s, during the Reagan era, if that's going to tell you what's happening, um, it was very different than it is even now. Obviously, they've got the social media, et cetera, et cetera, going on. But the, the rules of the game have changed significantly. It used to be that you could not go forward with a story until you had two independent, verifiable sources of information. Now it's just go with whatever somebody tweeted. Um, and that's... And we can't blame the news media. We cannot blame the news media because there's a couple of reasons why. One, this has been a long time coming. This goes back to the, uh, uh, the Broadcast Act of the 1920s. Uh, it was the Radio Act of the 20s, the Broadcast Act of the 1930s. Then you jump forward to the 1980s under the Reagan administration where they deregulated the FCC, eliminating the requirement that broadcast entities operate under the public's best interest. And they also eliminated the restrictions on the number of broadcast and news outlets that could be owned by any one entity. So from 1985, I think it was, there were approximately 80 different organizations that owned the top 50, no, it was 80 organizations owned about 100 of the top media outlets. Now we're down to six. Six of them actually own everything in the US. There are six companies that own all of the, everything you read, see, hear, listen to. Six companies own it all. So that's what we've gotten right now. And quite frankly, if we didn't watch and listen to it, they wouldn't do it. They are purely commercial entities. And so it is our own fault for allowing this to happen. We as the public, and we're humans, we're fascinated by the Kardashians. It's like a train wreck. Yes, we want to see it. I know I should be watching PBS and Discovery, but I do want to watch TMZ, I'm sorry. So I mean, it's just the human nature. But yes, there is dialogue to try and help educate the news media about it. But I think 
the real key in this is better science education at the school levels and helping people understand what's going, what the realities are, careers in science that are available. I know we do a lot of that here at Oregon. We bring kids in and show them what the realities are. I've got a whole bunch of info on the, uh, the pop culture image of scientists and what they are. They're always nerdy in a lab coat. A lot of times they're evil. Usually so socially awkward and inept. Um, it's the stock character, but that's, that's the world we live in. These are the world, this is the world we live in, we, but we can move forward to help educate. And many times engaging with those in the news media and letting them know you're a resource. If they have a question, you got a question, contact me. I'll explain it to you. Working with them so they understand the complexities of it. Sometimes you got to ask them the questions. You can't ask them to read the story ahead of time, but you can say, I'm a resource for you. You have a question in my field of experience, I'm willing to work with you to help you understand that better. Did I answer your question? Anybody else? I know we're running behind here, so. Thank you very much. Hope it was helpful. My clicker, need to get in touch with me, there's me. I told you you could read all my slides, couldn't you? <laughs>